I'm three months fresh as an assistant professor back at Colorado State. I did my residency there under Dr. Hannah Van Campen, who um, was the diagnostic virologist. And I want to give a heavy amount of um, acknowledgement to both Dr. Hannah Van Campen and then also um, Dr. Angela McCluskey, who's um, at the USDA, for helping me comprise or pull this together, um, especially with in light of the Colorado data you're going to see later, um, specifically pertaining to VSV or vesicular stomatitis. So, just kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about. A lot of these images have come from Angela McCluskey, who she has gone out and um, she's been working most closely with the VSV outbreak that occurred in 2014. Um, we're going to talk about, though, the organism, kind of do a refresher of the history, get into the transmission and the epi um, to build up the economic impact of this disease, and then finally some prevention and control measures and what actions have been taken since VSV has been um, delisted um, federally. So as we move forward. So to remind us, vesicular stomatitis virus, it is a rhabdovirus. Um, it has two strains that typically serotypes that circulate um, within the United States, and those are New Jersey and Indiana, you most commonly hear. The disease usually results in vesicles um, of the oral mucosa um, on the tongue, the lips, the gums. We can also get coronitis. So when we see this, one of the key things is when we get the vessel, vesicles, they can rupture. And so when they do rupture, they can release virus. And so as we talk about later down the road in quarantine and things of that nature and the disease, um, the clinical signs we are seeing, it'll be important to kind of just keep that in the back of our minds. And then the host range, I've just included the, no, the usual suspects down here, but it's important to realize there's a large host range for this um, virus. And so cattle, um, horses, even humans, it is zoonotic. Um, it's been documented in fox, coyotes, rodents, insects, and maybe even plants have been implicated. Um, so, as I said, it is a zoonotic concern. Um, there is important precautions you should carry out when you are handling, or especially if we're going to be dealing with any of those vesicles and oral lesions. Um, like I said, when they rupture, we can also have release of virus particles. So. What you'll typically have in a human is a flu-like illness, um, fever, chills, malaise. And so obviously the, the people that are more exposed to these lesions are people that are working with the animals, laboratory workers, they're at higher risk of infection. And so if we think about the history of VSV, um, we had a horse-like illness when I started going back in the literature. So I don't typically study VSV. This is a whole new fun ballpark for me. but. Um, when I started looking back into it, we had initially in the 1800s just a general illness resembling what now we call VSV, so same symptoms that we see now. And then the virus was actually identified in 1927, so it's a pretty new one um, to our, our veterinary genre. And in the 1950s, we did have some human infections recorded. They're kind of hit or miss um, in terms of the, the recording of actually how many people were affected in the incidents. But Really in the 1980s is when we started seeing outbreaks in the western U.S. And so this is where we typically had these previous epizootic waves. And we now, I, you know, going back in the reports, it was dec in decades, so it was decadal um, occurrences. But now I think we, as I'll show you later, we can have every two to three years that we'll get a pretty big outbreak occurring. And so this is what's closer to my heart. I study a, another virus called blue tongue, but it's transmitted by similar insects, so especially the culicoides that you'll see up here. But if you notice, this is quite a laundry list of vectors that could potentially transmit um, VSV. And some have been implicated, some have been documented. Um, we still, in the epidemiology of this, cannot pinpoint the exact one vector, but we do feel like it has some seasonal component, is related, um, and so many of these are competent vectors, meaning they can actually have the virus and be able to transmit it back to another um, host or vertebrate host. The grasshoppers down here was one of the most recent and um, published most recently in terms of a vector that could be implicated. So the other thing, though, about this, it's not just a strict vector-borne disease, and that's something to keep in mind as well. We can have, if there's epithelial um, surface touching, we can have a transmission through any tongues, through, or through you know, grooming activities, um, cuts on the skin, or even with fomites. So veterinarians, people that are handling um, these lesions can, again, as I said, when it ruptures, that virus is pretty um, infectious. So 
The other proposed sources of plants, they're less documented in the literature very well, so I think as we look through this, it might be something to, looking in epi studies to explore. So if we go through the, the epidemiology of this virus, the geographical distrib distribution, um, there, it is present in North, Central, and, and Southern America, South America. Um, there has been a, a recent emergence in the Eastern Hemisphere, and we're not going to talk about very much here. But the key thing is that we do have it in the Southwest U.S. Um, and as we're getting warmer, the climate change, I, I study a lot of global climate change and its relationships to vectors, especially with blue tongue. But you can only imagine as we get warmer climates, and more vectors, it, it allows for these enzoic cycles to occur. So um, that moves us into our seasonality portion. So as when temperatures get warmer, we do have wet seasons. Wet seasons provide for great larval habitat for some of these vectors. So that's why there's this yin and yang with wet, wet seasons, warm temperatures. That promotes vector activity. It can also increase some of the activity, and this is the epidemic curve of the 2014 um, outbreak, like I said, Angela McCluskey, again, gets a lot of credit for helping me comprise these slides. This is her data where in July we can get this nice seasonal peak. And if you look at most veterinary vector-borne diseases of importance, you'll see this type of epidemic curve. Um, usually what we think, the vectors are actually getting active long before in the hotter months, and then we actually start seeing some disease incidents pick up. So. As I said, summer and early fall, um, there has been some implications for point sources. So these viruses are uniquely, very genetically unique when they cause an epidemic. And right now there are some um, certain agencies that are going after funding in order to understand with now this next generation sequencing and things like that, what those unique qualities of these sequences related to these epidemics that might be occurring. So that, that'll be interesting to find out as soon as we get that data. And then um, there are overlapping, you know, New Jersey strain doesn't just stick to New Jersey and Indiana doesn't just stick to Indiana. There is some overlapping um, ranges for some of these serotypes that you'll see. So again, morbidity and mortality, the morbidity events that we see, it's usually it can range from 5 to 90 percent, but for the most part when I was looking, digging into the literature, it's between 5 to 20. So most animals will seroconvert, um, especially during one of these epidemics um, in the epizootics, we'll see um, seroconversion. And then mortality is higher in adults. It's very rarely reported in some of our younger populations. But again, this is kind of an acute self-limiting disease. The death rate is pretty rare in both horses and cattle. Um, it's mainly commodity loss that you'll see. And so the clinical presentation. Um, when we see this, we'll see horses typically are going to express fever. Um, they'll have excessive salivation due to the vesicles. Um, it's highly irritating to their mouths. Um, I think I was with at a meeting with Dr. Rohr, our state veterinarian, and this year, Angela also confirmed this, Dr. McCluskey, but it was the ear, year of the ear. So we had more lesions in the ear than we had typically before. And then in our cattle, again, vesicles, we can also get it on the teats, so you can imagine during milking, um, that can be very agitating for these dairy cattle. And then coronary bands, we can get vasculitis around there. Um, the swine, this is important to realize that swine can be infected by vesicular stomatitis virus. And these lesions, again, like I kind of said, it's acute self-limiting. They usually resolve within 7 to 10 days. <clears throat> So the clinical disease, one thing to bring up, um, and I think we all probably know this in this room, but vesicular stomatitis virus gets a lot of um, heat or maybe some credibility because it is very similar. This is a cow with oral lesions here, and this is vesicular stomatitis actually from the most recent outbreak in 2014 in Colorado. But if you can imagine, it looks very similar to foot and mouth disease, which is not present in the U.S. that we know of. Hopefully. And the main thing is, is that it's received as all the vesicular diseases. It's it can be sometimes confused. And so that's one of the reasons it's received a lot of, um, a lot of notifiable disease um, credibility. Sorry. And this is just reiterating that point. So as we look at our species list here, cattle, pigs, sheep and goats, as I said, um, 
this is the one disease that can affect all species. So we can have clinical signs in all species with this vesicular stomatitis virus, whereas the others, we typically will have at least one or the other species that's not affected. So again, a large species range kind of reinforcing that point um, of clinical signs. And so that leads to us thinking about the economic impact. So I kind of looked into the figures again, and in 1928 we did have a drastic economic impact in California. Um, it was $97 um, to 202 lost per head, and it affected, devastated most of the California dairy herds um, within the Tulare, Stanless Loss, um, similar areas that we've mentioned before. And then in 1995 we also had a New Mexico beef herd that there was a significant economic impact. But I think one of the most important things we need to realize when we have losses, it's usually because of increased culling, it's increased, it can be increased mortality, usually there's more morbidity events that are occurring, but we have a reduced milk production in our dairy herds especially, and then there's also all the other costs that we've just heard from our previous speaker that go into this, the labor, the medicine, um, and the veterinary costs that are associated. And so this comes back to my world now, um, my, new, my newfound world of diagnostic virology. So when we think about, you just see these clinical signs, and I've kind of mentioned that there's a number of different diseases that could be associated with these clinical signs. It was really important, and Angela stressed this throughout the last outbreak, it had to be confirmed, and we're going to go through a picture here in a second, but it had to be confirmed with a laboratory diagnosis. And it gets a little tricky. Um, this is maybe changing in the near future, but virus isolation is one of the gold standards. It always is for virology. It's not very, very rocket science ideas, but it takes a long time to do a virus isolation. So they've created a number of other um, assays and ELISA, which is now only run at MVSL for the moment, um, which is National Veterinary Service Laboratories in Ames, Iowa. Um, there's also a complement fixation test, which is very labor intensive, but also a good, it's the gold standard for serological confirmation. And then there's other antibody tests that you can use for export testing. So in the laboratory, quite often, we'll use what's called serum neutralization tests. And that's these paired sera, cute convalescent, but again, usually for just export testing. And so the big thing is that there's no specific treatment available. So it's usually just supportive care. Um, there is a good prognosis if you get all the secondary infections um, taken under control. But production animals, they may suffer losses just due to the seven to 10 days where we're gonna start seeing all these clinical signs. And this brings us to vaccination. So one of the big questions that um, I get from producers quite often is, is there a vaccine available? And there is a vaccine available. Um, usually it's used in Central and South America. There's discussions, at least in certain um, literature sources, that vaccines may be available, available during an outbreak. But at the moment, um, we usually, we do not vaccinate within the US, United States, as far as I'm aware. So quite easy to disinfect this guy. Um, it's a rhabdovirus again, so it's easily inactivated. Um, usually you wanna clean up the organic matter. So there's two reasons we're gonna talk about prevention with cleaning up organic matter, but for this purpose, the more you can get to the actual virus, clean up the organic matter, um, have a contact time of 10 minutes at least, and the disinfectants are listed here, but a good source just to be able to go in, clean up your barn, your facility, especially if you've had um, active horses present with VSV in that situation. And so as I'm talking about prevention, one of the big things about advising people is to, same with most vector-borne diseases that influence agriculture, decrease exposure to the vector population. So a big frustration for that I've experienced with blue tongue many times is the usual recommendation, well, you know, get your animals housed at what's called the crepuscular period, but during dawn and dusk. That's when vectors are most active. That can be maybe feasible for horses, equine species, but it's sometimes probably not very efficacious or effective for your cattle populations. And so the main thing is quarantine, segregation for any of the infected versus the non-infected, and then um, sanitation and insect control programs. There are a couple novel insect control programs we won't go into right now, but um, also, again, a source of research. And so this brings us into our recent outbreaks. And I, I was on the phone even yesterday with um, Dr. McCluskey because she just has updated up to March 13th of 2015. So you guys are getting quite up-to-date data. Um, but this is all now from her information that she provided um, to help me build these slides. And so the rec recent outbreaks, not only in 2014 that we're going to discuss in depth today, it almost matched the premises numbers of 
at least 445 in 2005. So we were up to premises 430 was the last count that we had. And so as you can see, there's sporadic outbreaks or epidemics that occur in cycles. And in fact, usually our southwestern United States, states in particular. And so this is, that's just kind of giving you a historical perspective of our recent outbreaks. But if we look at more of the visual side of this, four main states were affected within the 2014 to 2015 situation. And I'll give you a temporal breakdown here in a second. But this again is from the USDA website. And they actually did a substantial amount of surveillance in order to identify the counties that were affected, the states that were affected, and the timeline. And again, I can't give enough plugs to Dr. McCluskey for actually, she kept this website as you go into it, if you just Google this, she kept it up to date almost at a weekly to monthly basis. And so one of the big things is that she reported we did have Nevada, Arizona, and Nebraska, excuse me, Arizona, Colorado, Nebraska, and Texas all affected within the 2014 outbreak. And these are representative counties. Larimer and Weld County was significantly affected. And so if we look through the timeline, basically the first case, or the incident case that started, kicked off the outbreak, was in Texas. This is just kind of giving a timeline. On July 17th, we found the first equine premises in Colorado. And then, as you can see, the last confirmed, as we go into an outbreak situation, there's always the last confirmed to be released from quarantine. And this continued all the way through until actually March 13th is when we've had the last confirmed and released animal from quarantine, and that was in Arizona. And so this just gives you a simple idea of the cumulative positive samples for each species. We can see that equine species were most affected by this particular outbreak, bovine. We've actually started an investigation with one of the dairies to exploit the culicoides system of this all. And then Angela, Dr. McCluskey, and her husband, Brian McCluskey, are also actively involved in trying to identify vectors within sand fly systems and things of that nature to see if there's any correlation between these numbers and particular risk situations out in the field that would support. And so I just wanted to do a bit of show and tell here, but just let you know the severity of this particular outbreak. Clinical signs we can see on the muzzle of this horse, there's drastic ulceration. And typically, Angela was saying that this was a classic situation of what they would be seeing in the field, also around the oral mucosa. And then also the sloughing of the tongue. We have vesicles within the tongue. Again, wearing proper protective equipment, but like I said before, the one big thing about this is that when the vesicles do rupture, we can have release of virus. And then, again, this is the year of the ear, having lesions within our oral penna. And then this is what I was talking about, what Dr. McCluskey really was able to imprint on me, is that one of these on the right was more of an animal abuse case. And one of the big things about this particular outbreak is that distinguishing abuse from actual VSV, vesicostomatitis virus. And so that's why it really hits home what it was so important to have diagnostic testing done on each and every one of these horses, not just strictly based on clinical disease alone. And so we're going to jump into the response that their network did. There has been a passive surveillance program by private practitioners, voluntary basis. There was a quarantine and hold on the suspect premises. In terms of the collection, one of the big things was that there was collection of serum, swabs, and tissue tags. And all these had, at this point in time, and they still are at this point in time because this Colorado CSU Diagnostic Lab is not running the test yet, but all were sent to National Veterinary Service Laboratories and run free of charge to the client or owner in the epidemic. And due to the zoonotic potential, again, just wearing the gloves, like we had mentioned before, it was really important, remains very important. At the time, the premises were quarantined for 21 days after the lesions had healed. So that's one critical component because as we talk about actions in the future, Dr. McCluskey said that quarantine might be changing in terms of time period. And so 
One of the big things was just reexamining before the release dates so that, you know, as they were released, no new cases were coming in. And so the response, again, there's, like our previous speaker had mentioned, there's a two-part component to this is that there's attacking the outbreak or the epidemic in its form, but also doing education and outreach further. So recommendations of the affected premises was just what we had talked about, prevention, surveillance. Information has been publicly available throughout this whole process at a rapid speed. It normally, in terms of these types of epidemics, doesn't get updated, especially to the point of March 13th. So I think one of the things that, to give the USDA APHIS system a plug, was that Dr. McCluskey was getting this updated in an expedient manner for outreach. And so, again, she's gone to the more efficacious way as we're all getting a bit more savvy in our nature of communication, but Facebook posts were also getting out and information was able to get spread that way. And so as we get into research opportunities, this is the part that I get pretty excited about. We're actually involved, I'm involved with some of the work they're doing at the USDA APHIS system. We're going out to actually identify maybe some overwintering mechanisms of some of these vectors, overwintering mechanisms, not only the vectors, but also the virus within the vector. So that's a critical component and distinction. The viruses were isolated from many of the premises. So when I was getting back to the genotypic characterization of some of these unique genotypes within specific outbreaks or epidemics, that might be something that we'll, we have now at CSU the advent of next-gen sequencing that's coming on board. And so with that, we might be able to do some of the specific mutations that could be related to phenotype, which would be the expression of clinical science in animals. And so, again, on the epi side, though, I know Dr. McCluskey is still actively involved with epidemiological questionnaires, identifying risk factors, what could predispose a farm or a particular location to VSV. And then just case control studies for both the horse level and the herd level could be advantageous. And so coming back to the VSV side with the virology wrap-up, just kind of the take-home points, and especially since I was not in Colorado during this time, but the impression that I received whenever I talked with Dr. McCluskey and Dr. Van Kampen, they're similar to those of foot and mouth disease. So it is important to always get a diagnosis back in the lab. Just to make it clear, FMDV, I know this group probably doesn't need this, but does not affect horses. VSV does, however. And so the reason really for performing these diagnostic tests, if we want to get an active diagnosis, real PCR or complement fixation is still the gold standard on serology to identify a case. The ELISA is being run at MVSL still. So when that transition may occur, that's also a good source for diagnostic testing. The critical component, though, is VSV serum neutralization tests should only be used for export and not confirmation of an actual diseased animal. And so, as I said before, prevention and control just measures are including quarantine, fly control, restriction. And the big elephant in the room is the epi. The epi side of this is still poorly understood, exactly what vector, what risk factors, and things of that nature. And I think as we go into the future, it's something to be, you know, the updates are VSV has been delisted. I'm glad our state vet is here maybe to help me field some questions, Dr. Keith Rohr, as we go through some of the regulations. But after talking with Dr. McCluskey yesterday, it does remain reportable at the state level. So that will be important to rely on accredited veterinarians. It's going to put it back on the accredited veterinarians to collect the samples. And the big change now that we've delisted the disease is that the diagnostic lab, if we become a diagnostic lab that is going to run this versus MVSL, no longer will the test be for free. So now it's going to put it back on the owner or client. And so the movement restrictions then will, you know, secondary to confirmation will be based on suspect cases. So the last bit, and this is something that Dr. Rohr might be able to help me on if we've actually confirmed, the quarantine period, there's some discussion of shortening that period. And, again, accredited veterinarians will have to play a bigger role in kind of helping facilitate that quarantine period. 
And so, again, acknowledgments, both Drs. McCluskey and Dr. Van Campen um, helped me critically in the preparation of this presentation. And with that, coming back to Colorado, this is my beautiful scenery that I can have. 